The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. Yeah, yeah, that's why I told you to we, check it. We, we, we are recording right now. <laughs> Dude, this is like, Did you get that? Yes. Yes. This is like the Raptors just annihilating the Rockets or something. Did not start with this as the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> you, we'll don't you don't want to talk about soccer, Dane? Dane, you don't want to. Happy Wednesday. Good Lord. <laughs> I'm not watching this one. I'm turning on Barcelona Roma. Anyway, do you want to? Should we start? We'll start and we'll cut it out. If, Maybe. Yes, we will. Maybe. Do you want me to just start talking? Yeah, let's do it. Wolves Wired Podcast, Zone Coverage Podcast Network, here as always with David Naylor, Tom Schreier, Dane Moore. We're not going to talk about soccer this evening, or this afternoon. Dane will get mad. I don't want Dane to get mad. <laughs> I just want to <laughs> hang out with you blog boys. And Dane. <laughs> Dane wants to talk, talk about the hoops. He wants to talk about the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, or the Cincinnati Reds. <laughs> <laughs> blog boys or Cincinnati Reds. Let's go. So let's Tom, Tom wants to talk about esports. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about Which Fortnite. Which totally doesn't watch. <laughs> Fortnite, <laughs> Fortnite is technically an NBA-related topic. Okay. Technically. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> this is our first podcast since our live show at McKenzie. So uh, if if you listened and you didn't like the sound quality, we're sorry. It was the first time we tried it. And we're it will get be it. better. It's going to be better at future shows. Blame uh, Tom as always. It was it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it was my fault. So since we potted, we saw the Wolves beat the Mavericks by one point. Uh, two days later, we saw the Wolves lose to the streaking, surging, whatever you want to call them. Utah Jazz. I just call him good. Featuring sharpshooter Ricky Rubio, the, who had five the, threes in that game. Destroy the as, Wolves. As we speak, the four seed Utah Jazz, mm-hmm. who were nine games under five hundred in January. Yep, it, it's insane. So, like, so let's point this out because we already kind of discussed this with Terry Stotts and Portland. Isn't Quinn Snyder the same story? Like it wasn't working. He found a way to make it work with. As you wrote, Dane. it's the story with every coach who's a, a player of the year, or, or coach, coach of, of the year, year candidate. It's the same thing with Dwayne Casey. The they noticed that what they were doing was good, not great. Completely changed the way the offense functions. Nate McMillan with the Indiana at the beginning of the year completely changed the way the Indiana Pacers played. Quinn Quinn Snyder, I would say that's less less of a full on like scheme adjustment, but it is a willingness a willingness to change Terry Stotts the emphasis on defense for the whole year and then in Minnesota we got the same old same old well because the the, the thing with Utah right is their big swing back happened as soon as Rudy Gobert came back from injury so it's like what Utah's identity in past years has been is still the same because they're still like they've got Donovan Mitchell they've got Ricky but they're still Rudy Gobert's team and yeah. him coming back has been the biggest key of anything. Sure. Um, Messi just Because he's still really, really good. Messi is also really, really good. Same. We're equating topics here. <laughs> um, but, like, the the Jazz, like, right now it's shaping up like, well, after last night it's not as certain, but it's shaping up like it could be Jazz Spurs in the first round, which I think is a bad series for San Antonio. But, as we talked about before you showed up, it's literally a one-game difference between the seven-seed Wolves and is it the four-seed the four Jazz? Seed jazz and the five, yeah. Like it, It's still unbelievably close. The Jazz have a tougher schedule than the Wolves, and I think every other team The Jazz remains. can still technically catch the Blazers. Yeah. Who randomly lost to the Grizzlies what? last night. I would be shocked if the standings held as they are right yeah. now. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally don't think they do. And I I have a feeling that Utah might get the four. Yeah, the, that's the way what it's seeming like. The way like they're right playing, now. they have the two LA teams back to back. They have Golden State and they have uh, another good team, Portland. Portland. There we go. So that could be a pivotal game. Yeah, well, Utah Portland is a last day of the season game. Minnesota Denver is a last game of the season game. Uh, I want to say New Orleans San Antonio is a last day of the season game. Mm-hmm. Like schedule makers. Didn't know this was coming, but it's shaping up that things are going to be close enough that when next Wednesday, a week from today, the last day of the regular season, is going to be totally insane. And like we <laughs> we talked about it a little before the podcast too about 
tiebreakers are actually probably going to matter. Uh, what were the odds that all these teams could actually, like a bunch of these teams could legitimately finish with the same record? It's crazy that this is actually all coming. And uh, as I've been on for two months, that's really, really, all, really good for all the Wolves. Season. I, think you, I think you first <laughs> talked about tiebreakers in like November. In, I... I'm not, Janu- that's not a Janu- rip on you, man. No, you, January you was foresight. January was where I started like actually paying attention. Well, just because they were losing to all Eastern Conference teams. Yeah, yeah. and, and I'm like, on the West. It's, <laughs> well, it, that's it's, how it works. it's still the thing that we that I talked about last night is they are the seven right now as we speak, and the three teams below them: New Orleans, Denver, Los Angeles. The Timberwolves are ten and zero so far this season against those teams. They have not lost a game against the teams through eight, nine, ten right now. That's wild. You know what I, I think is, and what made me think of this is when you said the Jazz will probably be the four seed, David, is I look at the standings right now, and one to ten, I think that's the order of what I believe these teams are. If that, that is how I would rank them. I would say the Rockets are the best team, the Warriors are the second best, Blazers, Jazz, Spurs, Thunder, Wolves, Pelicans, Nuggets, Clippers, in that order. I do think that, and obviously this is probably changed by... Uh, to some degree, it'll it'll change by it'll change by the weekend for sure, just because the teams will play each other. But it is funny how it's kind of played out, and the the cream has kind of risen, and the the teams that haven't been able to you know kind of put it together and are the ones that I mean the, the Timberwolves and the Pelicans and the Nuggets from from their dysfunction and the Clippers even more so, kind of over. Their, the second half of the season, they they're starting to put themselves in another in a, a tier below the. What I see is the the Portland, the Utah, and San Antonio, and Oklahoma City. We've kind of bunched them as three through ten, but I think obviously the the shellacking the Wolves took on on Sunday is we don't, those teams don't all belong in the same bunch. There's but, a, a line for me. So the interesting thing for me is that on on body of work, I agree. Yeah, the thing that's going to matter right now is current form. Sure, and I think that Denver goes way up in those rankings on current form just based on the last week. And if that's you, a small sample going, size. I was going to say, is that a? If you're going on current form, the Wolves are in trouble. Because, yes, like let's go back to both the Wolves and the Pelicans are in trouble. The Wolves lost to the Grizzlies. Near- it took it took a 56 point performance from Towns for the Wolves to beat Atlanta, and they still only won by single digits. Then they beat Dallas by one. And then they lost by over twenty points to you. And they it's nearly just bad form they later. nearly lost in New York, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that wasn't a great game either. Yeah, let's not That's forget true. that they lost by to Philadelphia by thirty two. So here, so the two good teams they played, they got smoked. <laughs> Portland within the last week has also lost to Memphis and actually lost to Dallas. Mm-hmm. So. Again, as we've been saying all season, the Wolves aren't the only team this happening to. And Portland, who's the team that had separated themselves, is still having these kinds of losses with their full roster when they're trying to clinch the playoff seed. Like, I'm not saying they're, they were, they might be kind of coasting. Dame got hurt in the Dallas game uh, yeah. last night, which matters. But, like, so uh, these things still happen. Even when it's actively bad for the tanking teams, as sure. we've talked about, mm-hmm. like the, Dallas the, winning last night is horrible for their draft standing. Sure, but but that's the old the organizations tank the players talent. Right? Yep. Mm-hmm. I my question for you is healthy staff, healthy Butler. How do you rank the teams? Does Minnesota go up, and does is Golden State now the number one team in the second round going forward when he's back? Well, it, if he out of Golden State, round. I guess let's just take those one at a time. They have said he's definitely not playing in the first round. Yep. So, I mean, come come second round, if Steph's back and if we're operating under the assumption that he's 95% of mm-hmm. what he was, then, I, then I, yeah, put, put the Warriors over the Rockets. But I think if you look at the body of the work, body of work from this season, the Rockets have been so impressive. We, oh, yeah. we just got done lauding the Jazz, and the Rockets have been They've better been doing than that the, all the Jazz. Year. The, yeah. Literally the entire season. Yeah. Been doing what the Jazz have done. So, so yes, to answer that first... But that's that's assuming a fully healthy Steph, and and I I think with with Jimmy, if we do the same thing, assume he comes back to ninety five percent of what he is. I mean, I don't think he they the Wolves definitely jump any of those teams. I think it becomes a fair fight against a Portland, an Oklahoma City, a San Antonio, a, a Utah. I think it becomes a more than fair fight against San Antonio. I you just. I, I it's get cliche, it. but it, but the playoff experience matters, yes. and and that's that's a factor that I can make. I mean, 
You can make the case three of the five starters in the assumption Jimmy's healthy are have playoff. So experience. here, here, sure. here's your here's your interesting thing that I keep keeping an eye on with the Spurs. The the thing that Spur I've seen some Spurs people talking about. Spurs, by the way, lost to the Clippers last night, which is a bad loss for them. They could have pulled away up into the four and did and, and that, not do that. And that's not that far removed from beating Houston, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sunday. <laughs> yeah. So they have what's going to matter the most for them in terms of seeding. The Wolves might not see them, so this might not matter. The Spurs are thirty-one and eight in San Antonio this season and are 14 and 25 on the road this year. They have a worse road rec- road record than the Wolves. Than the Wolves and they have a worse road record almost than the Lakers. <laughs> it's within half a game. Like, They've also the 18 previous seasons had a road a winning road record. Yeah, so and they and they they've always been great in San Antonio. We know that the Wolves haven't won in San Antonio in like 100 years. M- my but question like, for you is are you are you saying that that's who you would given the options that's who you would like the Wolves to face in a first round series? Assuming, of course, assuming that, out New Orleans, Denver, right, right. L.A. out. Yep. Yes. Okay. I uh, guess I don't think I don't think New Orleans gets up there because New Orleans is mm-hmm. the one I would take over them. So it's essentially a question of Portland, San Antonio, uh, and Oklahoma City, and then and obviously Utah. Houston, oh, I and don't Utah. want Utah. Utah. <laughs> yeah. I do, want, do you want nothing to do with Utah. <laughs> Do you want Oklahoma City second then, or who do you want after? That? I I want Portland. I'd rather play Portland than San Antonio. That's fair. I, I mean, it might not it might not be Portland. Portland. We talked about body of work and recency. Yep. And their stadium's notoriously tough, right? <laughs> Dave, nope. I just asked Dave Benz. Um, <laughs> uh, the <laughs> the difference uh, the difference I see is in roster construction, and I. I, I like the way the Wolves match up against the Blazers. Um, they, they lost that game in Portland, which is the last time they played them. Uh, I, I like the way the Wolves played in that game. That was it was one of the, was it the first game without Butler? It, um, no, well, it was the first loss without Butler. No, no, it was the first full game, right? Or no, no, no they, they played those two terrible Sacramento, teams. Chicago, yep, 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 yep. Uh, Portland, then Utah. Um, Excuse me. But I, I I do I just like the way the Wolves match up against the Blazers. Said this a million times. Yep. I don't uh, Nurkic doesn't scare me in the way that a Stephen Adams type center does against Towns and and they uh, Al Farouk Amino is having a great year as a as a shooting stretch big and a defensive stretch big. But he's not going to punish a Bielitsa or Gibson in like the the stretch four making way. And I think that the with Wiggins and Butler the the Wolves can throw. Long, strong defenders on on CJ and Dame. Yep. I mean, you're not gonna stop them, but those are those are things that that match up well. Put Jeff T on freaking Evan Turner, or Mo Harkless, and it'll be it'll be okay. It's not not ideal, and, but they they have they can match up with Portland, and it doesn't puncture the Wolves in the way other teams do. And looking at the standings right now, um, and kind of how the schedule seems like it shake it might shake out. If the Wolves take care of the business they need to take care of and win at least one game against Denver, probably the last game of the season, the home game, they have a pretty good shot to get the six, which makes that Portland-Minnesota series feel pretty likely Mm -hmm. at this point. The reason I put it that way is because Oklahoma City also has a really hard schedule to go. Uh, and Oklahoma City is in actually really bad shape with the teams in the tiebreaker. They they if if I did the I did the look at it last night with it's Oklahoma City, Minnesota, New Orleans, Denver, the six through nine right now. Oklahoma City is out of the playoffs if those four teams in the season tied. Hmm. They have ha- they have not played well against those teams this year, and it matters. Like, you know, it's interesting. I I think I hear that. I know that's true. I think Oklahoma City is definitely going to make it because I think they're good. Yep. Um, but what's interesting about that is if Oklahoma City misses the playoffs, the Wolves don't get their pick. Yep, from the Rubio <laughs> trade, <laughs> which is which is which is the God. thing in the background of all of this. Because like I saw somebody oh, somewhere be, be so like, funny. if the Wolves miss the playoffs, at least they get their pick. If yeah. Oklahoma City misses and the Wolves make it, they don't. They don't it. have yeah. a first round pick in this draft, <laughs> which is well, yeah, not a scenario I believe people expected at all. Ah, it's because <laughs> because Russell Westbrook brought him to be the sixth seed last year. They got Melo and Paul George. If they're, I mean, that, and they've been worse. Oh, if man, they're somebody, losing games. Somebody tweeted the per thirty or the per forty eight and the advanced numbers comparing Carmelo and Michael Beasley this year, and Michael Beasley's numbers are like a lot better. 
It's it's incredible. Well, and that and that was like that like the the Thunder lost to Golden State last night. Westbrook has some monster statistical game, and it's not good enough to beat the Warriors without Steph, which is a very good team yeah. that's not playing for anything. Well, it's it's interesting with that type of player that you think of Carmelo. You think of him as the the primary option was was a scorer, but not an efficient scorer. And you would think that be, moving into a third role that that would help the efficiency because he clearly still has a strong skill set. That's kind of similar to what's happened with Andrew Wiggins. If you think about it like that, we, we thought moving him into a third banana role is going to take away some of that inefficiency scoring. But sometimes these players can't shake their style or their mental makeup of being a number one offense and still play offense in in that same way. So yeah. I think that's why you see that reflect in, right. in Mello's stats. And I think with Andrew... Well, I wouldn't. I, I some people I think have gone too far to say like this year has been a massive disappointment for Wiggins. Maybe I just had low standards. I, I've liked a lot of what I've seen on the defensive end from him, but to. offensively, offensively, if we just kind of look at his his offensive profile over last year to this year, it's essentially the same. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's concerning. What I do want to talk about though is Denver. You were just talking. If the Wolves take care of this, let's, let's kind of break down through this these final four games. Yeah. On the road against Denver Thursday, back to back. Well, that's on the road at Denver in altitude. That's a factor. With a back to back coming the next day in LA, so they need to travel to LA. Who don't suck right now for but yep. player. counterpoint to that? It'll be their third game in four nights. They played last night. They're playing tonight, and then they're playing Friday. Friday. Okay, didn't like, know that. That's good because that's like they and there's they're playing hard games right now because they had. Um, Boy, who was it last night? They had um, the Jazz. They had the Jazz last night. Mm-hmm. They have the Spurs tonight, wow. and then they have the Wolves on Friday. They, so they are at home. Um, no, no, they were in Utah last night. Yeah, okay. In Utah last night in LA against San Antonio tonight. It's not a long drive home. or not a long flight. No, you but like so, the the Lakers like we talk about the Wolves going in on. Altitude back to back is a thing. The Lakers will have a night of rest, but they're playing a busy schedule against really good teams right now. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's important. So we, I think you, I think I was looking at a tweet that you had quoted from Matt Moore, mm-hmm. who essentially laid out uh, with the standings the way they are. They need one win against Denver, and then they need to beat one of Memphis or L.A., and they're in. Basically. That's, basically. All, that's, that's the, really all it comes to. And for their to. position to be better, they need to beat both Memphis and L.A., right. which obviously they should. But just to make it, which I think people were freaked out big time about, especially after it's, that massive Utah It is going to be scary if they lose on Thursday no matter what. Yep. Like Because Denver pulls even with them in the standings with a win. They will also pull within a game of like five other teams so it's not the only team that denver's denver's coming for but like because the thing with denver and the wolves if like i've tweeted a lot about this yeah denver has to win not only both minnesota games but their game against portland Portland to to get the the tiebreaker over the wolves Mm -hmm. so like denver has to win out in a lot of ways to make it unless one of the other teams loses games they're not supposed to lose. Looking at you, Pelicans. Mm-hmm. Like, I am, <laughs> I am... The Pelicans have lost four straight. Some of those have been to bad teams. They have Memphis tonight, who have been peppy lately. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> That's a great word. I, they have been. They keep randomly beating playoff teams when yeah. it's actively bad for their draft uh, status. The, the, well, I think J.B. Bickerstaff is just like, screw yeah. this, I'm not going to be back. And and the players are all like, I'm probably not going to be back. I don't care if we yeah. tank for the pick. Yeah. So, so, like, yeah. And Marcus Gasol's probably like, screw this, I don't care about a draft pick, I want to win. So that's like, like, I think there was a disgruntled Gasol story that came out. I'm sure he's trying to win right now. So that's like, if if that happens, like New Orleans will be, is, will be within a half a game of the Wolves in Denver tomorrow night, no matter who does that game. Um and they're the team I'd be almost more worried about than the Wolves. Now, flip side of that, if the Wolves win tomorrow night, they will their magic number for Lugensian will be one. I I'm, can almost promise that because they'll clinch the tiebreak over De- Denver. They'll be two games up over Denver with three to play, and the Clippers are probably going to get eliminated tomorrow night because okay, the Clippers okay. have the Jazz. Okay, <laughs> so again, if they to, win to 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 complete this. What it is is it's. At Denver on Thursday, at LA on Friday, home against Memphis on Monday, and home against Denver on Wednesday. I think we can we can spin out a million different scenarios here, but 
I I know for a fact what the players are focusing on is the next game, and I think that it, uh, that is obviously where the, I think our focus should lie yep. to. And I think it's particularly interesting with the given the Jimmy Butler, Jeff Teague, Derek Rose injuries that are looming to different degrees is is the fact that they do again play on Friday. So what I'm what I'm wondering is and it seems to be this operating assumption that Jimmy's going to be back tomorrow and I I don't think that that is what I think he could play. I'm not saying he isn't going to be playing. I certainly don't have any information that that's the case. But I was there at practice yesterday and heard everyone talk Jimmy talk about it, Tibbs talk about it. It is not. It does not seem like a predetermined thing. They haven't talked about his minutes distribution. They haven't. I mean, I don't. I don't think they're necessarily there yet. And when they factor in the fact that they need to play a back to back on Friday at, at L.A., I completely agree with. I what think you're the it makes sense. While it'd be great to have him for Denver, because all the reasons you just said, David, they're the one we're going to pin them up against. We're going to talk about this more. It doesn't necessarily make that the, the best move to come back on Thursday if it's on the road. Friday makes a lot of sense because he's definitely not going to play a back-to-back. I, he's only going to play one of the two games. And that's where I would say I think he should play the Denver game. Because if he's only going to play one of the two and we know that for sure, mm-hmm. which one do you want to be at as full strength as you can be for it? I think they can beat the Clippers without Jimmy. Lakers. Or Lakers. 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 Other Lakers. Okay. Sure. I, I mean, there's a there's a whole other day factor. And then I don't know if you guys read Krasinski's report from, from last night that he said that Jimmy, from his sources, that Jimmy has long been eyeing the Monday returning Monday against Memphis that has been the operating plan um, and they're hoping it could be before but I think that should be the assumption is Monday against Memphis mm-hmm. game 81 and then game 82 against Denver because like we said I, I that even if they do lose this back-to-back both of those games if they beat Memphis on Monday and Denver on Tuesday that should get, be able to get them into the playoffs I that I think that's what I'm going to go off of as my most likely game for Jimmy Butler to return is Monday. And then I think that Jeff Teague, I think Jeff Teague is further away from coming back than, than Jimmy Butler is from, which surprised well, me. I was going to say that was, that's been the thing that's come out from practice the last couple of days um, that has surprised me is that Teague seems to be further away than we thought. Cause it didn't seem like the injury was felt like that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Probably we were at McKenzie when it happened. Yeah. So I don't think any of us paid that much attention, but it seems like it might be more impactful, and I like he di- he's not been cleared for contact. He didn't practice with contact yesterday. Yep. I mean that's that's a pretty clear sign of it, uh, being a couple days away. In an ideal world, right? They'd they'd sweep like Denver, L.A., least, yeah. and then you have two games where Butler really can just. In an ideal world, they win the rest of their games. Well, it, yeah. it's if, if I hear what you're saying though, yeah, no, yeah, no. if they sweep Denver, L.A., they clinch a playoff spot. A- a- yeah. And right. then, and then, and I then, I don't think that I could. That's even a question. Like, yeah. they, it can be done on Friday if they do that, right? Yeah, I think okay, but but Denver, it's crazy that Denver is. Uh, it's gonna they're gonna enter that game. Denver is gonna be a half a game behind the Wolves on Thursday, and two of the four games for the rest of the season are are against the Nuggets. It's why Denver controls their own destiny. If Denver wins out, they make the playoffs, yeah. regardless of any other team's results. And this is what I found was was really interesting is. Last year, on April 5th, the day that they're playing the Wolves, so literally 365 days prior, they were also in the ninth seed, half a game behind the Denver Nuggets. Literally the exact same situation to get into the playoffs. I know this is kind of creating a narrative, but that team is going to be hungry because they don't. They have a young core on the fringe of a big financial upkick in Jokic's concert concert contract and the money that's coming i don't think that team is any bit content with being the nine seed this year it's 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 a huge it's a huge matchup and for them they're they are going to want it they're they're essentially a year ahead in the progression of that the wolves are and and denver the they've won three straight three straight difficult matchups against a couple eastern conference teams and one um direct matchup in the west i forget who it was against but They've done the thing that Tim and I called out like three weeks ago. Paul Millsap has started to look like a real scary part of that team Mm -hmm. and is back and is playing full minutes, and they are firing. Like that Indiana team that Denver beat last night is right up there for the three seed in the East. They are a Mm -hmm. very, very good basketball team that is playing for playoff seeding. Like they are 
wanted that game. That was a home game for Denver. Never mind. Yeah. But, like, that's th- these are good teams that Denver is going out and beating, and their offense is doing what they signed it to do at the start of the season mm-hmm. now when they need it the most. That's why they scare me a lot right now. Their defense isn't. But nope, it's not. It, that, right. And that's what, I guess, to, to further extrapolate, I'm writing on this for tomorrow, is uh, – is the there's so many similarities between the two teams elite offense one of the worst defenses in the nba denver only denver phoenix and sacramento have a worse defensive rating than the wolves over the past two seasons um yet they're both these very effective offenses led by these dominant offensive centers I, it's i know people struggle with the Jokic cat comparison and I, I think that's a struggle there because they they're pretty different types of players but still, they go through, and you talk about that in Indiana game last night. Jokic came out and like was not messing around yep. in that game, and they run that offense through Jokic in ways that the Wolves don't with Towns. And I, I, I do think the the positive to take away from that in the Millsap point is that uh, is how much better they've gotten with with Millsap back. And then it's just another reminder that the Wolves are going to get a lot better without. Um, or once once Butler's back, the difference is for Denver. Denver went twenty four and twenty in the forty four games Paul Millsap missed. The Wolves are operating at a losing record and a point differential that's a very very bad losing record. They're they're eight, or they're ten and twelve on the year with Butler out, and most recently they are performing at the level of the Phoenix Suns or Sacramento Kings, one of the worst teams in the league net, as m- measured by by net rating. So I guess it, it's interesting, and to me, it, it signal signifies a better team, better coaching in Denver that they are able to lose this veteran foundational piece and still be an average NBA team. The Nuggets were, and 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 the Wolves without Butler turn into a a clear cut lottery team, which is an interesting reminder of the difference in situations too. Because there's been talk in Denver that Mike Malone loses his job if the Nuggets don't make the playoffs this year. Well, it's, it's exactly the same thing. He was brought in to be a defensive coach. This is his third year, Thibodeau's second. But there are and there's been no the talk. worst. There's no talk like that here. Well, maybe uh, it's maybe Tibbs in another. It, well, it's, it's his Tibbs' contract. Mm-hmm. He's the president of basketball operations. That's why he signed this deal. This is why he wanted a deal that made it very hard for him to be fired and mike mullen doesn't have that so to be fair the narrative next year would be he's because this will be his third year he's going into his third year yeah this is the end of two yeah no he's actually safe through all next year too so it really in the fourth year you could let him after the fourth year and that's because he has a different different contract than yeah than malone but i i also think there's a little bit of difference as much as we're the the hand wringing there is over tibbs is the wolves are going to win 15 more games than they did a season prior the nuggets also, are going to win a couple more games but they're they're lit, like i just said they're literally in the nine seed with a couple games uh, left and also they're probably really, gonna be the nine seed again is the best thing for the nuggets to let malone go like it feels like you're punishing him for the west being really close and I, I, I think we can back up even further what was what's the difference between the nuggets this year and the nuggets last year with the exception of paul Millsap? is there one I don't think there's a big one. So essentially, they're doing. Ex- they're not playing Emmanuel Moody a major minutes. Okay, that's well, that makes that a difference. Matters. But what I'm what I'm saying is, they're essentially in the same spot they were last year. I don't know what their record is off the top of my head, but I think their their performance last year taught them how to tread water without Millsap. And now that he's back and healthy, he's a boost. Rather than when the Wolves got Jimmy Butler this year, okay. they relied on him heavily because he was clearly just this competent superstar he, he, two-way level player and then they lost him and it's back to Wiggins and Towns and it's a 31 win team essentially mm-hmm. without Zach Levine and without uh, a point guard that's played with Towns and Wiggins before Jeff Teague was brand new to the team they looked awful those first two games Butler missed uh I think that's the bit the main difference between the two right now what about okay and obviously Jimmy but- acquiring Jimmy Butler even what the price was that they had to give up was a no-brainer move. Sure, he's a, he's a star, but what's happened in Denver, as you just were describing right there, Tim, presents an interesting hypothetical for the Timberwolves. What if the what if the piece that they would have gone out and added would have been clearly a number two to Towns' number one, as Millsap is clearly a number two to Jokic's number one? I think a lot of the issue in Minnesota is that is that Towns is 
is somewhat being capped. I mean, it, obviously his his season is great, but there's there's so much more room for growth. Yeah, for Carl Anthony Towns, and I wonder if we would have seen more of that growth this season. If I mean, let's literally just say Paul Millsap is here rather than rather than Jimmy Butler. I don't know how much it's the Wiggins Lebron argument, right? Wiggins should be better because he's not in Lebron's shadow. Wasn't that the thing? Like in Cleveland, he would. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I mean, there. I know I, I understand what you're saying, and it makes sense. But the, the thing I struggle with is this team without Butler. I mean, they've had some blowout losses, but some of the most I think frustrating losses are the ones where they're in the fourth quarter, they're down like seven, mm-hmm. like say to a Portland team, the one loss they yeah. had. That one, you like Butler's absence was glaring there. If the Wolves had a Paul Millsap and he was gone, I mean. Are you really going to be down seven and think, oh, this team really needs Paul Millsap right now? I, I, I think that's it's, the it, difference. It, it's, the Grizzly, yeah. it's the Grizzlies game. It was terrible. You should never be that bad against a team like that. Butler might gut that game out. Sure. Right? Or, or even like against a good team. Like Obviously, against the bad teams, I think it's even more evident. Like You can't lose the bad teams, and Jimmy Butler is the key component like vocally and just in terms of the way he plays people play up to Jimmy Butler. I, I'm by no means... T- oh, I know you're like, saying. I, what I just find interesting is that the Nuggets and the Wolves are literally as good as each other right now. The Nuggets added Paul Millsap. The Wolves added Jimmy Butler, Jeff Teague, Taj Gibson, Jamal Crawford. You know, and they're, they're, yep. they're kind of still at that level. When If you'd say at the core, the Wolves were Towns, and at the core, the Nuggets were Jokic. To, to add all those those pieces around it and be at the same level to me actually signals that Malone has done a far better coaching job than Tom Thibodeau has. Do you, I, I, think, I think that that's probably fair, but I'd also, I'd also throw out that I think Denver is just clearly deeper than the Wolves, too. But dude, I, no, I they mean, play like seven or eight guys. They, they have one of the... They yeah, the but, they're, but their sixth and seventh and eighth guys are like Will Barton and, I mean, yeah. <laughs> like more effective players than Jamal Crawford. And well, I guess Tyus I, Jones I, has been... But that's coaching, too. too. Like, Tyus yeah, you're Jones... Right, you're right. Their, their bench, the Wolves' bench could be fine if they would have used it differently. I, I believe that, and obviously that's somewhat speculative, but... You could have used Tyus Jones in a different way so as to grow him more this year. Clearly, we've seen with Bielitsa that if they would have done things a little bit differently, that that's fair. They could have gotten better. And Jamal Crawford has some, obviously has his shortcomings, but is a is so, a capable bench player. And the other thing to keep in mind is what you said before: they were a thirty-one win team the mm-hmm. year before. Oh, I yeah. mean, I, I, you're just not it, like there is something, and it's probably unfair to the coach, but when things stagnate you get rid of the coach first and then you kind of start to pull mm-hmm. up the roster, right? Like at the beginning of the year, we all predicted win totals. They're at 44 with four games to go. I predicted 40. I mean, I think David, you predicted a lot, but I mean, <laughs> it, you like we, you knew going in, it was but, a high but end. David, game. David would have been right. Or if they David, didn't lose to bad teams. I mean, right, I think right. that's kind of exactly. We just got over but saying what I, how that's yeah. what I'm saying is with, they're going to finish within our range of win predictions. The, the four of us here's and, I think we were all going in with the expectation that they weren't going to be just a total disappointment. So even if they miss the playoffs and they win 45 games, I mean, with I think that's just more of a case of the West being what it is this year than the Wolves necessarily being bad. I think big picture is important. Well, we we so, just have okay. more information yes. now. Sorry. Right. Can ahead. I go back to a Denver point? Of course. Uh, here's a point that's not necessarily Mike Malone coaching being an improvement thing, but the roster construction being better. One of Denver's six through nine players that plays significant bench minutes for them is a two way player. Yeah. To Tory Tory Craig. Craig. Yeah. And who actually literally looks like Marcus Trojus hunt. They play exactly the same. Way. Like, and that's the kind <laughs> of thing is Tory Craig's beginning minutes and doing stuff mm-hmm. all year and being a part of the team. Started rotation. numerous games. Yeah. Like, and then, and then you've got, like, Trey Lyles, who mm-hmm. struggled in Utah, got traded to yep. Denver as a piece, has developed into a useful NBA bench player. Is there using, like, they've got Devin Harris, who is your mm-hmm. token veteran NBA bench player, and they've <laughs> got Jameer. Mason Plumlee. Yeah. Uh, but, like, Jang. but you've got Torrey Craig and Lyles, both of whom are doing significant things. You have, in the Wiggins role, you have Jamal Murray, mm-hmm. who has started like every game this year and has maybe not been as ridiculously impressive as he looked like he might be last year, but has been very, very good. Yeah. So it's the comparison I, might not necessarily be in 
like specifically coaching style, but it might be in that player development area. And I mean, oh yeah, that's a mess too. Like yeah. Dan, what you were saying about the utilization of the bench. Like I'm looking up game logs or whatever of the bench players for Denver and. Yeah, I mean sporadically, like Tory Craig has gotten thirty minute stints or twenty five minute stints, mm-hmm. and only I mean, necessity talking, enforces that in Minnesota. It, Injuries, it, and right? Foul trouble. If we're if we're looking back at one of those games where Tory Craig played thirty four minutes, I bet he made a couple stupid mistakes in there. Mm-hmm. Where if he were a bench player in Minnesota, he would would have gotten yanked for Andrew Wiggins. I mean, like so, that would have happened, and he would have played thirteen minutes. So let me let me try this. I feel like Tibbs' job this year, so they can't make the playoffs, or they can't miss the playoffs in this scenario, but sure. is to create a winning culture, literally get a winning record, and give these guys, especially Wiggins and Towns, playoff experience, as well as indoctrinate them into the Tibbs mentality, right, that Taj has, that Jimmy has, that Rose, I guess, has. <laughs> like, do you... Uh, I had to do it. Uh, so, And yeah, I think I do think Rose. Teague and Crawford do, too. Yeah, okay. I think they do, too. Yeah. I mean, by proxy this season. Sure. But, yeah. I, my question is, I feel like his job, or I guess my point is his job description changes. It's wake up the Wolves to let's start turning screws and, like, kind of perfect them, for lack of mm-hmm. a better word. That means changing the roster so you have more shooters probably and just some defensive help off the bench. It's also just a bench you trust and will play more. Yeah. And then I think it's get them from, let's say, 46 wins in that 50 win mm-hmm. range. And I think Malone probably is in that second phase where it was perfect Denver, right? Get them into kind of contender status or at least kind of where the Blazers and the Jazz are this year. Yeah, I mean... I- I think the goal for Denver this season was to be clearly a playoff team. Yep. Um, but they also, Paul Millsap's their second best player, and they lost him for 44 games. So I, I think given that, it's pretty impressive that they have the same record. I don't, I don't think Denver should let him go regardless. I mean, I yeah. just think that's the, that's the thing is instead of saying, oh, well, if Malone gets fired, should Tibbs? I think it's more, why did Denver fire Malone? Mm-hmm. Like that just... <laughs> That'd be second what, 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 how, how different do you think Portland... And Utah are like how ha- ahead of them are they as a team than Denver? Like, are they in the same category? Mm, no, I think at the beginning of the season they they might have been. And if we would have seen Denver have Millsap and things would have really clicked in the way that things are obviously clicking in Portland and in Utah, which we can't know, then yeah, I think they would have been. Yeah, I, they would they would be in that group. I think in an ideal world where nobody gets injured. Uh, as in Rudy Gobert also never gets injured. Yeah, that's I, I think another yeah, feather in I, Snyder's cap. Like I think you can make the case that the West would again be closer than it appears right now because then you have Boogie back, you have Butler back, you have Gobert back, you have Millsap back for the whole year, and suddenly I think that just the whole Western Conference is more. Let me, let me, and even Kawhi. Kawhi I was going to say, there's the fact the San Antonio Spurs have played 78 games without their best. Player. <laughs> and in that scenario, maybe the Spurs are the best of that group. But, so like, of of all those teams. All these teams have lost people. The team that's had the least impactful injury is the Timberwolves with Jimmy Butler of all those teams we just named. E- even over Millsap? You're saying well, Denver? Well, I'm talking about games missed. Oh, okay. But yeah, okay, no, you're okay. right. You're right in the in the impact of it because Jimmy's better than How Millsap. How long was Gobert out? Was he up? I mean, I, I think he missed 27 games. It's probably close then. Right? So, so it's more where Jimmy missed what? him, not the amount. But fair. That's that's true. True. There's also like the we we mentioned we missed one team in that of the top nine, Oklahoma City, and how big of a deal missing Andre Roberson has been for them, yep. who is not the star name, but no, how huge. bad their defense has been oh, without huge. Roberson totally. has mm-hmm. been another like, and that's the big loss. Like. You you hit we hit all the star names always like Gobert's missed time Millsap's missed time Butler's missed time that Andre Roberson's might have changed a team the most of almost any of those misses other than Kawhi like, yeah and the Spurs are still the Spurs sure. even without Kawhi they just have worse pieces doing the same thing like the Thunder did get Corey Brewer who was a poor man's version and he of him. I think <laughs> on like, the defensive end Co- well I mean when Corey Brewer came there he like he's such a spark defensively that yep. when he gets a steal. I think it woke the Thunder up even for just a few games, mm-hmm. and they looked like a really, really dangerous team again. But I think they've come back down to earth a little bit since then. But What I think scary from a Wolves perspective is that we just kind of went through that. Every one of these teams weren't operating anywhere near 100% for the course of the season. And injuries happen every season, but I think we can point to all those as 
a little more than that the average amount of injury right the average impact it's concerning to think that next season in a year where everyone is more healthy not perfectly healthy but more healthy that i think that pushes the wolves down so the, here's my question and it, forever it was oklahoma city and the rest of the division right in terms of how you would stack them preseason I, in, in just in general like i felt like they oklahoma the division went through oklahoma city that is being called into question now right with portland how portland and utah have played mm-hmm. going into next season is it an open race could any of those teams win the division i think that depends a lot on what oklahoma city does let's say let's say if they if they keep their big three yes because that's like Paul George. As in I think Paul, I think Paul George is the biggest question in the division. Because if he stays instead of going to the Lakers or anywhere else, why does the division matter though? No, the only question is uh, <laughs> tiebreakers. Tiebreakers. Division yeah. winner no, is the, the most. The, important the only reason why I ask is if you say you Denver. Win. Denver is not like as as in any of those teams mm. can win, but Denver. That's also a strike against Malone, right? Well. Yeah, I, think Den- I think Denver can win next year. I don't know. I, I think Denver is right up there. Like, at the beginning of the season, I said everybody but, <laughs> but Utah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and going into next season, I think it's an open race. And uh, like I- so, so I would keep your coach. Because that's a, if we go back to six weeks ago, nobody expected Portland to run away with this. Mm-hmm. With as far ahead of everybody else as they had, like what it if, could have been any of the five what teams if Denver, that Portland had done that. What if Denver had gotten Millsap back a week early and they had started their little hot streak a week early? Where would they be right now? I mean, it's close enough where they might be the five or something like that. Like I know it's we're throwing if they a billion if, scenarios. If they out win there. three more games, they're the five. What I'm saying is like or the four actually. They're playing really well right now, and it could just be a streak. That could definitely be, uh, but it could also just be. The Denver that, again, like you said, David, the Denver that we maybe thought that we'd see with a healthy Paul Millsap at the beginning of the year. And it's so close that I think we dismiss a Denver right now because they're nine, even though they're a half game out of eighth right now. If they were a couple games up, if they had won a couple games they were supposed to lose, I think the narrative's totally different on them. That nine is just, it's a, it's a glaring number because it's out of the playoffs. I, I think one factor, in, and I'm just going to say this because... The, what, what, who's actually in the division because I don't think people know that nor do I think it's important for them to know that the Blazers, the Jazz, the Wolves the Nuggets and the, who am I missing? Thunder. The Thunder. The Thunder are in, all in the division divisions are stupid. It matters because they're the, four, the teams you guarantee, you're guaranteed to play four times each season. Yep. That, that's, that's the a, thing that matters the most. That's like, the thing that matters the most. What, what you might think is that Minnesota and Denver are the youngest teams in that group meaning there's room for improvement which is inherently true that Andrew Wiggins, Carl Towns can get better, Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray can get better. However, the issue is is that both Minnesota and Denver are going to be in the luxury tax next season before one of the two of them likely is not going to make the playoffs. And to be in the luxury tax before showing a playoff pedigree is a scary signal for any, for any franchise. And that's why, in talking about Denver... That is why that is such a mandate this year, is that if we're going to start moving forward and paying tons of extra money for every dollar we spend in tax, they want to know that they have a playoff pedigree. And I don't think we've, we've started to wrap our heads around that yet in Minnesota, but that too is coming. And if the Wolves are a nine seed and dip into the luxury tax this offseason and trying to retool and improve this roster... That's scary because then there's the repeater tax. You'd assume if they're in the luxury tax next year that they'll be in the tax the year after that, which is all to say, yes, Portland might be a little bit older, Utah might be a little bit older, and OKC might be older. The Wolves and, and Nuggets are just as capped out in, in their inability to add surrounding pieces, and they're also not desirable markets to have players may become ring chase. Well, that's the hilarious thing about the Northwest Division as a whole, though, right? Is what's the most desirable market of the five of them? That's true. Like, yeah. there's Portland, I Portland guess. Portland yeah. is filmed there. That's like, nice. well, and, <laughs> and Denver has its benefits. Huh. And I guess <laughs> future Nugget Michael Beasley, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> they have all added... They have all added pieces that are, I mean, were relatively big names. I mean, the Wolves traded for Butler. That wasn't a signing, but I think we can kind of glean that he would have been willing 
to come play for Tibbs and was happy to be here. Millsap chose as an unrestricted free agent to go to Denver. And the Wolves were on his list, reportedly, yeah. for whatever that's worth. And, I mean, Oklahoma City, again, there were trades for Paul George and Mello, but those guys need to be amiable to the idea for those trades to happen. So I think we're also getting to a point, and this is just mostly a separate topic, is that I don't know if the attractive locations are necessarily what Westbrook is fine. Like he's People yeah. know who he is, even though he's in Oklahoma mm-hmm. City. I think... Mello is a great example where the thought was he would never leave New York, even though the Knicks really weren't going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But then he just got so bad that he had to. And, and really, they, <laughs> I think rightfully so, hit the emergency button. We're like, we just have to do something because. Yeah, eject although, button. Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take McDermott. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was that, that it's. Man, can you imagine if they had managed to get Oladipo to New York for Mello? <laughs> a big of a, like I think all lopsided. Well, it doesn't look lopsided right now because they got Paul George. But if that had been in New York, whoo! <laughs> right, that Victor Oladipo would have been traded for. And then Oladipo else. and Porzingis on New York, man, that would have been fun. Mm-hmm. Been, they, and Nilakina and Beasley <laughs> and Michael Beasley. <laughs> Watch Beasley's like comes out in a Nuggets jersey next year, and they're like, "Dude, we we didn't sign you. Like, yeah. where did you get that jersey?" <laughs> he shows up. Shows up I bought training. it at the store, like everybody else. What's wrong? He shows up to training camp, like, "Dude, you're on the Hawks. What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> He'd probably be fine with being on the Hawks. Um, be there are advantages there too. Can we? Uh, uh, I know. I know. This is obviously a Timberwolves podcast, but we've literally lurked in the depths of a three through ten seed for a while now. I think it's. In interesting time with the season winding down to look at the the high end talent in the league as a whole, and I guess I'm just kind of interested on the East has become pretty much just as interesting as the West, and I mean in seating wise, seating wise, yeah, but, but like, even more so interesting because I don't uh, I don't know who's going to come out of there to the finals. So the. If you haven't looked at the Eastern Conference because you've been weeping looking at the Western Conference standings for the last two weeks, which I would understand, <laughs> yeah. the East's eight teams are basically locked. It will take a yeah. miracle for the Pistons to Just make say they're locked. They're, locked. they're locked. So the eight teams are Raptors, Celtics, Cavs, 76ers, Pacers, Heats, Wizards, and Bucks. Who you got? So can, can, let's, let's start at the beginning. I think the first round in the East... I think every single series in the first round is going to be competitive and fun. I don't Mm -hmm. think there's a sweep in there. I love Toronto, and I love Boston with or without Kyrie in the first round. But, man, like Milwaukee-Toronto has so much potential to be a fun competitive series. Milwaukee, we were talking about Denver earlier, and we're not going to go back into that. But Milwaukee had like an eight-point lead with a few minutes to go against Denver. And and they just blew it. They they, they, they had a 17-point lead with like seven minutes to go. They... (laughs) <laughs> are they, they are Milwaukee's a team with the ability to beat really good teams and then they're also well, they're they're just wildly well, inconsistent. And it's the flip side is the narrative with Toronto is that they're wildly inconsistent in the playoffs and that Lowry and DeRozan both significantly right. have struggled in the playoffs in the past. So it's like if Milwaukee shows up and is their best selves and Lowry and DeRozan do what the popular perception expects of them yeah that becomes a really interesting series boston washington i don't think hold on i'm just gonna respond to that first okay i don't think either of those things happen i think toronto is substantially better than milwaukee i don't think lowry and derozan are gonna shit the bed and the coaching the way they start jason terry bucks are a bad team I would, <laughs> but starting Jason Terry is so, amazing but uh, so then okay but we can Thanks, talk Tom. about that, amazing. tom's here so but that's current standings. Miami, Washington, and Milwaukee are all tied right now. Same exact record, 42 and 36. So any of those teams could end up facing Toronto in the first round. And I think that I would say Washington is the most interesting matchup of those three to face the Raptors in round one. I, I'm really low on Washington, too. I, I, you're not are wrong. Are you high on any of the three? I, I like, I think he only, Indiana. He's a Raptors fan now. They're no, the Raptors. I, I am, I'm a believer <laughs> in the Raptors, though they have fallen off a little bit recently. I, I just, with the Wizards and the Bucks, is you're relying on star star power. Yep. Um, I think with the Bucks, you have Giannis, you have star power, and then you have a bunch of misfit toys and a coach who can't get them all in the toy bin. I don't think that team is gonna gonna work at all. John Wall, John Wall is is back. 
we don't know to what degree. He's had a, a very a very long absence. I, I, we've talked about Millsap and that you can come back and be better than ever, but there's very few very few games left in the season for them to to find their stride. I'm not even a huge believer in the the Wall Beal concept the concept. And you want to talk about a team that's in financial ruin and needs to consider retooling as is. I don't. I'm not big on Washington. What I like is I like teams that have been functioning as a team for the the entire season. Miami is super low on talent. Miami is my favorite one of those three for sure. I'm, they're not going to beat any of those teams, but I, I I think they can get they can give somebody a series. And Indiana has Indiana has some of that team element where they there's some it's congruent and they also have a star in Oladipo. I, I think those are the ones you have to look at. If I'm if I'm a Toronto, I am a Toronto fan, I guess. So uh, I, I want to take on Washington or so, Milwaukee. Okay, I don't know. I I'm going to counter to that a little bit. I think that's a little big picture for a seven game playoff series, at least for Washington. Well, I mean, I can go into a smaller picture of it too. I, like no, I mean, let's. I'm going to back up a little bit yeah. when I said that the Bucks can give the Raptors a fun series. I don't mean uh, it's going to go to seven games and each game's going to be by three mm-hmm. points. I mean, this isn't going to be Houston, New Orleans. Sure. I think Giannis Adenokounmpo, and I think Chris Middleton's a really mm-hmm. good basketball player for whatever it's worth. I think those two can give the Bucks a win or two. You mean Shabazz against... Muhammad's going to come in and give them 20 points We haven't even talked about the massive <laughs> impact of the Shabazz <laughs> Jay, Jay Terry duo. But I don't know. I think I think star power is incredibly important in the playoffs and I'm I don't know. I'm a, as big of a believer as I am in Toronto as a whole and I they're my pick to get to the finals in the East. Mm-hmm. I am also a big believer in Giannis's ability to take over a game and I think I don't think there's anyone on Toronto that can stop him. I think he's. I think that's a perfect team for him. It's very different than like again. a Detroit that's played like Cleveland in the first yeah. round. You're like, this is definitely going to be a sweep. I'm with you. It's it's not definitely going to be a sweep of the the Bucks or the Wizards because you're. I think that star power. You're right. Does get you a win or two. It, it always. And I mean, if we're talking about Washington and their goofy situation, and I mean, how much is Otto Porter making this year? I mean, it, it's it's a it's a bad fit of a team right now but they're also a very top to bottom good starting five assuming walls healthy mm-hmm. and they have a history of doing well in the playoffs so the the second by part, well again i mean yeah. like winning some games in the first round maybe getting to the second round if but i that's if, the thing if i can nudge us off of toronto another one of the teams that has a chance to face one of those three teams is the also very like the minnesota timberwolves cleveland cavaliers <laughs> with their <laughs> atrocious god-awful defense rim protector kevin love is and the, the precedent of showing that in the playoffs they can, I hate this term, but flip the switch. Yes. And so I that's think that's a playoff caveat. Cavs. All you have to look at is who's come, what player has come out of the East the last, what, eight years in a row? Seven, yeah. Seven or eight years in a row? It's been LeBron. Yeah. Mm. And this, like, this again, like, I think this is the year that the question is most clear. There are the most teams mm-hmm. that can potentially deal with Cleveland in a seven game series. But. Until someone does it, that's a question. So, so I, d- I don't think Cleveland loses in the first round. Yeah. But I think a 4-5 series between Cleveland and Indiana would be very interesting. I think if somehow it falls to Cavs, Sixers, or maybe that happens in, in the si- somewhere, oh, somewhere there. so I, much fun. I would not feel confident as a Cavs yeah. fan. So a couple questions for you. Do you think that Milwaukee should have signed Fisdale at the end of the season? Like, just brought in someone who's better than they currently... That was a Simmons thing. I'm not, it's not my idea. But, like, bring in someone who's more competent than their current coach. I think they were just trying to stem the tide for the rest of the season. They didn't... They thought that, that Prunty could come in and keep them a playoff team. It's obviously a big shift when you lose your coach, but Prunty was the associate head coach there. He's been around forever as an assistant coach in the league. I don't. I don't like totally disagree. I didn't totally disagree with that at the time. Like, oh, go get someone for Giannis. This season they'll go. This summer they'll go get someone for Giannis and a, a coach. There, in that there way. has to be some urgency, otherwise mm-hmm. he'll leave, right? If he doesn't feel like they're trying to win right now. Well, I, I think just if they would have gone out and signed someone mid-season, there's a chance that they fall out of the playoffs. Yeah. And and you don't have the time to really look through all your options. 
then in the middle of the year. So I'm not against it. Hasn't it hasn't worked out? Does, great. Is, is Toronto built to beat Cleveland? Like, it, do they? Is there any or any team? Is there a team that really matches? That's up the hard well? thing with my beloved the dinosaurs. Philadelphia seven, Philadelphia Seventy Sixers. <laughs> so, so I the way I see the Sixers, and again I don't know the East as well as the West. Say words. It's they fine. they seem like a team that if they just got really hot and kind of to borrow a phrase, irrationally confident. Like they're pretty hot right now. Yeah, I was going to say straight. <laughs> but but then they they have an injury, right? They well, I yeah, guess he broke sports, his face, and they yeah. still haven't stopped losing games. Yeah. Or started losing games. God, so they, they're they're, they're the they're the wild card, aren't they? Like just like they could, they have yeah. nothing to lose. Like they are, young I don't even think they're like a wild card implies that they could come up. Like they're a bad. very good basketball team. Like I don't think they're a wild card. I think like a team like Indiana's the wild card because like no one expected basically anything of the pace of the Sarah this year and Victor Oladipo has turned himself into a great player they could do something interesting they could play well they're a pretty well coached team that can do some interesting things mm-hmm. the 76 is one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference they're one of the best teams in the NBA yes and they're like if you pick on form they've won 11 straight games including absorbing some losses without the their best player in Joel Embiid they could come out of the East okay. absolutely legitimately yeah yeah and I mean they could, but this is. I have a question for you. So we just going through all the West in detail, and we all agreed that Portland is the third best team in the West, right? Like right, right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are the would the Philadelphia Seventy Sixers beat the Portland Trailblazers in but with a more playoff series in five? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if that if, <laughs> okay. oh, if yeah. that's yeah. true, yeah. if that's true, I think some people disagree with you. I don't. I actually agree. Then that means that the Philadelphia Seventy Sixers. <laughs> Are a top six team in the NBA, probably top five. Like, because, so who are you putting? You put them over the Cavs or the Celtics or yes. the Raptors? Uh, easily over the Cavs. Okay, over the, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I like. It, I, but it's funny. You just but you just what finish saying. I'm gonna wait until I see LeBron get knocked off before I knock LeBron you, off. You asked me a well. Yeah. It, I know. I, I, oh, oh, we, on, we switched. We switched points in the middle of that. I did. So I did. That's on me. That's on me. That's so funny. how wild would it be? We know that. Uh, Durant nearly beat Golden State, right, with Oklahoma City. They beat him. He joins them the next year. <laughs> you know where I'm going, right? Yeah. What if... As a blog boy, I'm not willing to comment on this. <laughs> <laughs> so what if... I guess it's not the same scenario, but what if Philadelphia knocks off Cleveland and LeBron goes to Philadelphia? Yeah. How crazy Here, is that? Yeah. Here's the thing that I want... Complete Just the be- process. No, it... I... <laughs> I think that a series that would be very, very fun to watch in the NBA Finals would be Sixers Warriors, just because. Sorry, go think on. about Joel Embiid against the Warriors. Mm-hmm. What do they do about him? Look they just they, they just <laughs> win anyway. <laughs> like they do just they do probably just win anyway. But it's like that that's the argument that we've made about the Wolves and the Warriors in the past years. It's like they don't have anybody who can do anything about Towns. Yeah, Embiid is like even. Uh-huh. As monstrous or more monstrous, and even bigger. Like, they don't have anybody that can deal with him. And the question is whether or not the rest of Philadelphia's roster can stand up to what Golden State does. Which and the answer is probably no. And I, yeah, but, that's what I'm saying is I, I do think they're uh, a year away. Uh, uh, what Simmons has done this year has been, you know, nothing short of amazing. Embiid is, uh, if you consider Anthony Davis a center, then Embiid's the second best center in the NBA in my book. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think what, what Dario Saric has improved into this year. I mean, watching him play, that dude is a, a weapon and not a role player. Like is a is a is a, a serious player. But then you kind of start looking at the rest of the roster and you go, well, they kind of JJ Redick made sense here, but maybe you, you know you that team's going to continue to be retooled over the course of the the next few years as they're maybe potential dynasty starts. I think at some point they hit a wall in the playoffs and they are actually 15 to one to come out of the East in Vegas. I, I saw that. So I would, they, if I were a betting man, they, consider putting a little bit of money on that. If they so have I the, think that's a very interesting move. Just current, current form matters in the playoffs. Even if right. the regular season, the regular season, I think that a team that is playing well at the right time, can do stuff in the playoffs. They like, would still. I, I'm really high on them, but they would still be my fourth most likely team to come out of the East. It, is it fair to say the playoffs will be better than the championship? 
Like it seems like all these matchups are gonna be super fun, and then we're gonna be like, didn't we? Aren't we here again? Because it could be Golden State, they Cleveland need to again. Redo can... the playoff format like the WNBA yeah. does it. Yes, I agree. How is that? I don't. It's, it's one, one through sixteen. It's no conference. So the Warriors and the uh, Rockets yeah. could face each other in the finals. Which is why, like last year, the Lynx and the Sparks played each other in the last the two final. years. Last yeah. two years because mm. they're in the both, in the both in the West, but they're clearly the two best teams in the NBA. It'd be like the Warriors and the Rockets playing in the NBA Finals this year. Mm-hmm. I, I also think it's impossible the number the of teams format. in the playoffs, but that's just that'll never decrease. happen. <laughs> yeah, or the yeah. amount of money or, in the or, playoffs, of play, playoffs, or, or 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 you do something, you do another Simmonsism, but the like the playoffs <laughs> to get in the playoffs, like I hate like that idea. No, the super. The, I don't no. understand. I don't. I, uh, this is. I maybe I need it explained to me better. I find the interesting as hell tournament not very interesting. Like. Why well, isn't so, so, that what's been happening? It haven't how this season has been breaking I, down been the interesting as hell tournament? I, isn't this week where the Wolves play Denver twice and uh, the Pelicans we, play the we, Spurs we end the and season, the this and we this? end the season with Pelicans, Spurs, Timberwolves, Nuggets, you, and um, we complain about one? minutes all the time. Why do we need to add more games? No, no, no. I mean, that that's the. Uh, I, I, that's fair. No, I think it's. More, I'm saying if you got rid of conferences, so we have that in the West. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's the case in the East, but. Regardless, sure. But that's also you I just said you want point. you want less teams in the playoffs. How can you want less teams in the playoffs and want the interesting as hell there? I, I, I want my are, cake and I want to eat it. Binary. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. I I don't know. I I think um, I I really do think the playoffs are gonna be fun. I'm 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 I, every one of those series as much as I was just kind of crapping on the the Bucks and Wizards. I do think they're gonna be worth watching and and there is a there is a real chance that they do win. That that I mean, the Wizards or the Bucks could win. Whereas when we said de- before, Detroit, you go into that series, they go, "This is 100 percent the Cavs are going to win." Bye, David. 100 percent chance the Cavs are going to win, and it's it's not that it isn't that anymore. Yeah, the NBA is in a phenomenal place, hands yep. down. It's going to be. It, it, what's weird for us <laughs> is the Wolves could be the sixth seed, right? And I went off saying that I think that their best matchup is the Blazers Portland. and they play Portland. And I think they would have a chance in that series if Butler's back healthy. I so, think it's really if you snag one in Portland early. I think that's what makes it interesting. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm more looking at it like timing-wise. There's either, <laughs> there's either six days left of the Timberwolves season or there's 30. <laughs> yeah, it's You crazy. know what I'm saying? If they go, because if they go two rounds, if they beat the, if they were to beat the Blazers and then they would go on to the next round to well, play the, the Wizards or the or not the Wizards to play the Warriors, um, but that ends up being a whole month left of basketball. But if things kind of go sideways in these next four days, the Wolves <laughs> Wolves season could be over. Jimmy Butler could be back in LA by the end of the w- next week. That's yeah. wild, you know. Like it, well, it's funny how it affects I mean, that, us that, too. Yeah, selfishly, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's important to know because I I, I, I want to take a vacation, <laughs> so you know. I'm for the Wolves tanking. <laughs> no. uh, I'm still saying, I'm still saying six seed. No, this is not popular. Six seed. It, other than that, I think. You said it, that at the beginning of the year, didn't you? Well, I, th- I think the 5 4 with Oklahoma City would be interesting. I w- no, no, no. I'm saying six seed or better. I'm just really at this point that if it's the eighth <laughs> seed against the Rock, if they stumble into the playoffs being to become the eighth seed. I think they're fine against the seven. Rock. The seven's interesting with Butler and no Curry, right? No, it's not. No, no they're neither not. neither are interesting. <laughs> they're going to stumble into either of them. They're going to lose it either of them in five games and then they don't and then they don't get the picks. I just don't I don't yeah, that's that's a good point. I, I think it's not just to get another rookie, another two rookies. They don't need another 19-year-old. This team needs a change. We just talked about how the whole bench needs to change. The team needs to be reconstructed in ways to get rid of a couple of bad contracts and to turn the assets they have into different things. The way that becomes possible is by having assets to make trades to do it. If they have two first-round picks this year, then they can do that this summer. That's well, that's huge. Let, let's back up a little bit before we get into the draft. I I already fast forwarded. Yeah, this. <laughs> hold on. Yeah. Uh, one, I was kidding about the tanking. I just wanted to put that on record. It was a joke. I don't want the wolves to tank, and I think I think they're going to make. Uh, I think we've. I've already got them to turn this podcast off at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Raptors wired. Yeah. No. Um, two, I think. Well. One, I don't think a, a, a Warrior series, even without Curry, is interesting personally. I've heard several 
people I and respect, interesting not you mean, just you, Tom. Interesting you mean in that it could be competitive. competitive. We would, it'd be, it would be super fun to go cover the it. The Wolves and being to, in the playoffs yes. would be interesting because yes. the Wolves would be in the playoffs for the first time since any of us were teenagers. You mm-hmm. both have beards. You didn't the last time they were in the playoffs. I still can't grow one. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think they're in a decent place considering all the turmoil and terror that I think has happened over the last, what, month and a half since butler went down it's been a, it's mm-hmm. been a roller coaster to use the lamest sports writing cliche out there but i mean made uh, things interesting no yeah. it, it's clear it's clearly a roller coaster i mean you look at the it's not just the fan base and if you take the pulse by you know talking to our friends or people who are close to or like looking at twitter i mean it's a it's a roller coaster of emotions of fire tibs of towns is scoring 56 i've it's, had friends tell me they're boycotting the team within yeah. the last two weeks multiple yeah. friends sources multiple sources <laughs> no but and then i think we also see some of that volatility in the wolves players and how it is in the locker yep. room i mean after it was a really the beginning of last week was really weird after that Grizzlies loss. The players refused to talk to the media, and it it came out in in signs of, like, aggression. And then first thing Jimmy Butler does when he addresses the media for the first time yesterday is he, he comes and immediately comes flailing out to defend Tibbs, which obviously he, he has the right to do, but it, it to me it shows their awareness and perception of how the team is being being viewed right now so it's this it's this really contentious and confused kind of environment by the fans and the coaches and the organization we're used to meaningful basketball being done in january like they are usually for and, all and there was versus, no honeymoon which is interesting yes none and I, I not think, bad i'm just saying interesting. well i mean that's that's part i'm sorry to cut you off but i think that's part of why it feels like everything is terrible right now fans are, have been conditioned for over a decade to also for for things to fall apart. I mean, they're not used to. I think fans are expecting this to just fall off the rails. So when things start to go bad, it's oh god, everything's terrible. Mm-hmm. Yep. Get Tibbs out of here. This isn't going to work. Yeah. Like when Teague signed and he started off poorly, Teague isn't going to work. Clearly, he's not going to work. The defense is bad. And although the defense is you're bad. right, and that's why we can't make these sweeping generalizations. That right. I want to be able to write that. Tibbs had a really bad coaching game against the Utah Jazz without it being implied that I think that Tibbs should be fired because I don't. I I think it, but we take these huge steps, and I think that's what you're saying, Tim. Yes. Is is that something bad happens and we want a, a massive shift immediately? I think we need to be able to roll with the negatives and roll with the positives as they come. I. You know, I, I want to be able to write about an excellent Carl Towns performance where he makes well, like 25 or 32 shots. I want to be able to highlight all the positives of that. And then when they completely crap the bed against the Jazz four days later, they need to be held accountable for that, too. So I think it's it, we don't it, need it, to push it so far. It's, in the it's like when your car is sliding, you know, some people yeah. you jerk the wheel and you end sure. up spinning out. It's mm-hmm. more just correct. Right. You know, like, know what you're doing when you're it's fish like, tailing or whatever. It's the Tibbs thing we talked about at the beginning of the pod. I am eternally frustrated with, uh, just as, like, a fan of basketball and a fan of teams like Philadelphia and Utah and e- even Portland, who I think their coaches are really good with their rotations. Mm-hmm. And then I see Minnesota, and it frustrates me to see guys like Jamal and Derek get no leash, essentially, even though they make yeah. as many or more mistakes as a Tyus Jones or a Nemanja Bialica, who have a very short leash. But at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean that I think that Tibbs is a bad coach because I'm critical of that aspect of his coaching. Mm-hmm. Because you still have to back up. And remember, in his first year, they won 31 games. They have oh. 44 wins with four games to go the following year. That means he's doing something right. And that's yes. important to remember. I What I just think is interesting is the... The over exaggerating, the the swerving that Tom's talking about, I see that in the players and in the organization too. In yeah. uh, and that's weird. It's just it, it's odd. It's 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 the same type of behavior materialized in different types of people. That I that stuff you hear your friends boycotting watching the Timberwolves because they lost to the Memphis Grizzlies. Well, the Wolves boycotted talking to the media afterwards. Towns literally didn't for the for the week. Even Jamal Crawford didn't. We got to talk to Emil Jefferson. That was the one person. I mean, there there is it. I mean, Tibbs is. 
is hearing the stuff and comes out, you know, angrily after John Krasinski, right? Something that is a somewhat of a, a, a critique. You, I mean, you see Jimmy Butler, he's hearing all these narratives about, about his coach and the team and, he, you know, he he comes back and swipes back. So it's this, it's this. I like that analogy, Tom. The swerving, the swerving back and forth, and I don't, I don't think that's commonplace in other in other markets. You have to get used to everyone has to get used to winning or just a functional team. I mean, I think yeah. that's true. And you, like, and, th- and then there's all the Minnesota baggage too. That team <laughs> yes, always lose. That's, that's and that's it. what Tim was talking yeah. about. Is yeah. yeah, you kind of expect the the worst thing to happen. But I don't know. I, I think it's a. I think uh, it's an important part of being a fan is being able to be very positive and very negative when the time comes. I think as fans, we need to make sure we do both. And as as the players, I think you need to, you know, embrace when the positivity is there and and when it's not understand that that's kind of what comes with losing a little bit. If it's if if it's actually in in line it, they can be held accountable for for losing to Memphis, and they can be held accountable for losing by thirty to the Utah Jazz. That doesn't yeah. make everybody blog boys. <laughs> Speaking of blog boys, do we you said you wanted to talk about it before? Oh no, I just think Shit. that's that's essentially the, the bunch of swerving on KD's part too. I, yeah. I I don't know what did what you you listened to the podcast a couple days ago. I did. Um, I think first of all, I think that Kevin Durant is in the majority of pro athletes in general. I think most pro athletes think that, uh, and to a very large degree, they're right in that they know things about the sport they play that writers will never understand because they're not actually out there doing it year by year. I Mm -hmm. think that's important. And two, uh, they just, a lot of stuff in pro sports, I would assume, again, I don't know because I'm a blog boy, uh, or behind closed doors, and it's, there's just some stuff we don't understand. And the one thing I really agreed with them on, and I'm guilty of doing it, uh, is guessing whether how a player is feeling about a certain thing. Mm-hmm. I think that's a dangerous game to play, and I think yep. writers do it a lot. And I think KD was right on that. Where he was wrong was in saying that writers don't watch games. That was the thing that I just couldn't wrap my head around. What I think it was is, is that he was generalizing right but even when simmons started throwing out names he threw out zach lowe's name that guy doesn't watch games yeah if zach lowe doesn't watch games then i don't watch any i don't watch yeah. television i don't, you don't know what TV. basketball is yeah. yeah um no i i think and I, I think that's i understand durant's frustration there are people out there that are not uh, you know inclined or do not have the pedigree to be asserting the opinions that they do, given the size of their Twitter followings or the size of their platform sure. that people are reading, and it's informing the opinions of what people think of someone like Kevin Durant, and that's that's unfair. I I understand his frustration there. It's not it's not fair. He it's not fair to not understand the industry completely. There are tons of people out there who are who are dedicated as journalists. And as writers, to knowing as much as they possibly can about this about this industry, mm-hmm. about the the game, and I don't think I don't think it's it, as much as that blog boy he's calling out for for writing something, tweeting something that is wrong. He's doing the inverse of that by by disclaiming all media as as false because. You know what is an important part of the game is is the way that it is distributed by the media so as to make money for the NBA so as to earn salaries for these players. The the NBA media is not we're not perfect right now. We aren't. There's we have Twitter at the at our fingertips to say stuff we haven't thought through. Um there, we're, we're incentivized to tweet all the time because that leads to followers and and we're we're incentivized to say negative things because those catch on on Twitter more often, or a, a harsh article you write is more likely to catch on than a a positive one. But I do think there are people out there who are who are trying to be as objective as possible, and there needs to be somewhat of a a synergy there and a you know kind of a mutual sort of respect because obviously both both sides. 
careers depend on it, you know? Exactly. And, and it's, it's, you, Tim, you said before that I think a lot of people share that mindset of Kevin Durant and just the... Not the, just NBA players. I think yeah. most pro athletes. Yeah, sure. I think Jimmy Butler strikes me as that type of person. And and largely a lot of the people in, uh, in Minnesota, on Minnesota's roster, and it comes out in the way that they interact with the media, they do it because they have to. Jimmy, can, Jimmy I, says that every time. He says, I'm doing this because I have to before he goes to the microphone. And can you blame an NBA player for thinking... I mean, not. I, I think you can blame an NBA player for thinking poorly of what Kevin Durant said, but can you blame mm. an NBA player necessarily for discounting certain things that writers no. use a lot? Like adva- analytics, essentially, mm-hmm. is the big one. I think an NBA player can look at that if i had been raised as this great basketball player my whole my whole life got drafted in the nba um but was an inefficient shooter or something but i was respected by my peers and i had a 10-year career i don't think i'd look at analytics fondly either you know what i mean but you see you do see some former pros who who come out to after they leave the game to being analysts on on television or yeah. Jim Pete obviously comes to mind for the for the Timberwolves and and finding a ton of you know a ton of value in that he re- relies yeah. on the knowledge of the game but how many, and uses that to strengthen but, his his but, points but I totally agree Jim Pete's great at it Brent Berry's great at it Doris Burke's great at it there there are several former players that use it and use it properly but how many what percentage of former players that are analysts care about effective field goal percentage or things like that? I, I, I mean, and I, it's my opinion that they should. I agree. What I'm saying is very few of them do. Sure. The entire TNT crew, with the exception of maybe, I, I think Grant Hill's using it a little bit, but then Brent Berry's another mm-hmm. obvious one. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't want to critique me, or like former players that are in the media because just like us Mm. in the media or NBA players are what they do. Everyone gets to where they are at a full-time role. Mm. Like we're writing about sports and we're getting paid for it. And I think I can speak for all three of us and say that we're really lucky to be doing what we're doing, Mm. but that doesn't discount how hard we've worked to get there. And that goes obviously the same for pro basketball players. And that's the same exact thing for a professional analyst, whether or whether or not they Mm. embrace analytics. All I'm saying is uh, discounting, a, a writer for how they perceive basketball is 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 tricky well and i think that's maybe the challenge to us as writers or as, you know as people who cover the team is to make sure that you know that we aren't we aren't allowing our opinions on a player say say paul Millsap, who we were who we've talked about a ton today it's it's on us to make sure our opinions aren't shaped by looking at his basketball reference page totally and whenever his name pops up in our twitter feed and regurgitations of other people's ideas of him it's on us if we're going to express an actual opinion on them to say that you know what i've done i've looked into paul Millsap. i watched him play last night against indiana and then i noticed this about his numbers there you know we but what's hard i think for us is we have 30 teams who are playing 82 games and to some extent you want to stay in the know about all of them and it's it's almost impossible and it's 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 embarrassing if you if someone starts talking to you about Lance Stevenson and you're like Ugh, I I don't act, I don't feel like I've watched enough Indiana Pacers this year to really have an opinion on them so the easy thing to do is to go to the stats page and to look at a number that probably points you in the right direction yep. and I think what players frustration is is they know they recognize that easy path being taken Well sometimes. like again this goes back to the beginning of the pod. I made it, it was a joke, but someone tweeted out Michael Beasley this year compared yeah. to Carmelo Anthony this year. Michael Beasley's had the better year statistically. If you ask me who I want on my team, I want Carmelo Anthony on my team. He, even despite his down, his sort of downturn in produ- productivity, I still prefer Carmelo Anthony. And sure. I, I think most players would agree. Yes. So I think most writers would too. Yeah. Um, I think some might not, but I mean. <laughs> I, I do the the one thing I will I will say about all of it is analytics might not be informing players on a micro level individually and that might have very little to do with the way that they recognize success in the game but at an organizational macro level 
teams are implying yep. statistical based strategy through through shooting places places where they shoot on the floor, the ways in which they defend, the way in which they tank at the end of the season, the way in which they put together rosters. I'm sorry, that's all math. Your organization, your team is applying that, even if you might just not be recognizing that uh, that, that is, is going on. And I think it'll be an interesting development to see where we go in the next five years because – as a media, our platforms are just going to get better and better with technology, and we have more and more of a chance to to alienate and to do things wrong. But but at the same time, you know things can adjust, and and players can also adjust too. To they might get more informed over over the the course of their life if it if these analytics are right. Well, that's obviously what I if like a to. team like the Rockets does well because that is very analytical. Yeah, it's informed. dude, look at the best teams in the NBA right now and you can't say that they are not analytically motivated. Toronto? I mean, F- Philadelphia is the process that the Houston Rockets shoot 53% of their shots from three-point range. The the Warriors are a an adjustment to to efficiency in basketball it's you know the who the bad teams are the bad teams are are the teams who don't implement strategies that are statistically effective that's what the kings are that's what and honestly that's what the timberwolves are and there's that's a a reason that the wolves are battling for the eighth seed and not the four seed it, the wolves are lucky that they have butler and towns who just mathematically are mm-hmm. and i test obviously sure. are huge pluses Mm -hmm. and they i think they just they keep the wolves over that they're uh treading water with those two right i guess is what i'm trying to say and and they've obviously done great things too because we can't as much as rip on their defense and scheme stuff they do have the fourth best offense in the nba so they did aren't they down to like 10th now or something no no no. they still have fourth over the most recent straight streak they've i thought they felt like 12th at some point throughout the offensive rating Uh uh-huh oh no no I'm, i'm saying right now they're fourth like throughout the whole year, they're fourth yeah. right now. Yeah, are we sure? Oh, I'm I'm looking this up because I don't know. In offensive, uh, unless rating? I miss her. Like the last yeah. game I went to, somebody had told yeah, me. They're, yeah, they're fourth. Okay, yeah. I feel better. Uh, someone had told me that they were like twelfth now. Like they had dipped that far. But I, I, think I think that's that over the Butler, Butler free stretch. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. which is which is scary. The in the time Butler's been off the floor, they have a negative six. Let's just get some analytics in here. Yeah, they have a negative six and a half net rating. Five boys. Negative six and a half net rating, which is worse than the Memphis Grizzlies have for the whole season. So, so essentially, the Grizzlies are better than the Timberwolves, and they should uh, tank. I think we're see. That's what the extrapolation can be. I don't watch. I haven't seen a game all year. So, (laughs) the the interesting. Yeah, I don't know. It the, the if you are really digging into just your team not everybody can watch all 30 teams but it, it's such a it's such a good tool to be used to confirm your eye test mm-hmm. it sucks that what we're doing right now and i'm a I, I do this from time to time too and i think i watch a lot is that i shape my eye test around preconceived understandings i have of statistics and that's something myself and all the rest of my blog boys out there gotta work on <laughs> um yeah yeah, Tom wants us to be done. I did 25 minutes ago, but we're good. Did you? I wasn't paying we're, we're, This is always what was wired. We're always almost done at an hour mark. <laughs> and then and, we go on. And it's great. It's good stuff. People I couldn't decide it. whether or not to talk about KD. So We said we were going to do mean, it anyways. We're blog boys. we got to fill the time for us not watching games. I mean, and good for... The funny part of all of it is good for Bill Simmons and like getting you know getting that interview and that that's what's sweet about the media is we we are getting such a cool insight into who players are these days and it's not all perfect but you have opportunities like that of uh, two he hours was, he was really good Chris Bosh was good there, Bill a Simmons lot of good stuff I mean I understand he has critics and they're they're warranted I mean he's he's said and done some questionable stuff but he is incredibly good at interviewing professional athletes. Yeah. Like he, which he we know from so experience is hard. It's not easy to do. They uh, usually don't like you <laughs> and yeah. that makes it hard. Yeah. So let's, let's wrap this up. You, unless you want to keep going Tom. bonus 15 minutes. <laughs> no. Okay. We'll be back. Uh, 
We'll be back, back this on weekend. Sunday. Do they yep. play on Sunday? No, they play on Monday against they, Memphis. Mem- so okay, so we'll come back on Sunday after the Wolves play Denver and the Lakers, which might make or break the season. We'll see, or at mm-hmm. least it'll give us a clear picture of where they'll be, whether it's panic mode or kind of smooth sailing at least into the playoffs even though this episode has felt like panic mode man how great is it to just still be having a huge basketball game on thursday in and just the as beginning a basketball fan you can turn on the playoff game picture oh, matters for the timberwolves in april that hasn't yeah. happened it's since fun to have both like to have a entertaining league and have a horse in the race or at least a team recovering i haven't watched netflix in like three months yeah it's just I finished Tark. Parks and Rec for the second time. <laughs> we're, we're a little I, different. Yeah, well, we've talked about this, but <laughs> the key difference between you and me is I need, I need. well, you might disagree. I need more breaks from the NBA than you do, I think. Uh, be a, a, a breaks. There's a break coming up. <laughs> see? Do you see? Yeah. That's exactly what I mean. That's the Tibbs answer. I, lo- I, love, I love watching basketball, man, but sometimes I just, uh, I just don't want to watch it. <laughs> that, yeah, that's what that's, it comes down to. And that's absolutely fine. Anyway. For David Naylor, who has left the building, he's at Prof Cedar. Tom Schreier uh, at T. Schreier 3. Dane Moore, he's at Dane Moore NBA. Uh, and even in the offseason, he'll be at Dane Moore NBA watching <laughs> Kings Pacers replay. I'm not that. No, <laughs> I'm no, kidding. no. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I will watch a lot of the playoffs. We've got we to gotta talk about uh, our, how much... How much content can we do, like, once the Wolves are out? we got to talk about that. Well, we will we'll, after we will. I say my Twitter handle. Okay. I'm at T-I-M-F-A-K-L-A-S. This has been another edition of Wolves Wired. See you next time. Peace out.